Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Smith, and I'm going to show you my face briefly because we're supposed to have masks on whenever we're indoors here at UC Davis. But I am with the Bohart Museum of Entomology, uh, as you see in the sign behind me, and I'm going to cover that up in a moment because that's where I need to sit. Um, but this afternoon, and this is the first time I've ever done something like this, I much prefer the, the live face-to-face -face meetings like we have at open houses, and hopefully that'll all get started again toward the end of this year where we can have lots of people in and, and show them things in person. Um, the talk today is on mimicry uh, using butterflies and moths as the examples. And this is something that's always fascinated me. I've had the opportunity to make 10 to 12 trips to South and Central America. The, uh, the numbers and the, the extraordinary colors and beauty of the butterflies and moths down there uh, is, are, shows great examples of how they can mimic each other or other things in order to survive. So I'm gonna start with a couple of things here, and this will be probably the last you're gonna see of my face. I know that's not gonna break your heart, but we'll move over to a, a camera. And I've got a lot of props off to my right, and I'll be moving back and forth there to, to show you things. But let me plug a book. And I didn't write it and we don't sell it, but this is an amazing book on insects and other arthropods. So things like scorpions and spiders. And it speaks to species in tropical America but it, uh, all the information really is pertinent to things you would find in North America as well. So if you've got kids who are really getting involved with bugs, if you yourself are just interested in insects, this is only about a $38 book, even cheaper if you get it on Amazon, but it is a wonderful book for reading. It talks about all the little curiosities and idiosyncrasies that the, uh, the insect world and arthropod world have to offer. And doesn't go into to great depth on them, but it's just very nice, easy reading. So something I really recommend that you get. Um, one thing we can you can do is if you have any questions, you can type them in using the chat button on Zoom, and the uh, questions will be fed to me or verbally by Tabitha, who is our our outreach coordinator. And I hope to be able to answer every single question that comes in. And with, this is scheduled to go until about two o'clock. If it goes a little bit over, that's, that's the way it goes. And we, we don't have any buses to catch. So let me change things here, put up a different prop. And again, the, the topic is going to be on mimicry. And mimicry is just defined as the close resemblance of an animal to some other animal, some other a plant or some inanimate object. And we'll talk about the mimics uh, versus the models. So mimicry doesn't necessarily mean just one bug uh, mimicking another bug because we have lots of things. And I'm just gonna just touch on camouflage very briefly because camouflage is a form of mimicry where the, the insect is pretending to be something like the bark of a tree as we see here. These uh, are underwing moths and they, they have two ways of, of defending themselves or trying to get from uh, being eaten that, that day by, for lunch by some frog or a bird. The first is they're not active during the day unless they're disturbed. And they tend to rest on a surface that they resemble with their wings closed. So on the, the bottom left, you see a, uh, a, an underwing moth, the genus Catacala, with the wings closed. And then a picture on the right showing it how it just about disappears when it lands on the trunk of a tree. Their, their little brain is wired so that they tend to move onto or land on a surface that they, they resemble. And they've been doing this for hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of years, so it works for them. If that same brown moth landed on the white bark of a birch tree, it probably would be eaten pretty quickly by a bird because it would be noticed very easily. Now, if they are disturbed while they're resting there, they may suddenly flip their wings open and show these bright orange, bright red, bright pink colors on the hind wing, giving them the name, the underwing moths. And that is intended to startle that predator just long enough for the moth to get away. So they use both camouflage and a fright coloration in their effort to stay alive. And of course, the, the classic uh, camouflage that we always show people when they come into the museum is this, leaf butterfly from Asia. It's found in India, it's found in Thailand, it's found in Taiwan. And with the wings open, it looks like it does on the bottom. Yeah, the colors aren't real true here, but the, it's sort of a dark blue and then the bright orange band across the wings. And then with the wings closed, you see it on the top, strongly resembling a leaf. And since most of the predators like birds and lizards and frogs that, that would eat insects like butterflies, 
don't also eat leaves, the more this thing resembles that dead leaf, the more likely it's going to last for at least one more day. So if this butterfly is living up in the canopy of the tree, if it lands on the, 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 uh, a limb on the tree, or perhaps it smells or detects some food on the ground, when it lands down on the ground to feed, it's gonna close the wings up and blend right in with all the dead leaves on the ground. If it sat down there flapping its wings open and closed, it's gonna get spotted and probably get eaten as well. So the, the camouflage again is one form of mimicry. And some of the butterflies we have in California and out throughout the United States are things like these angle wing butterflies. Yeah, I'll try to do this as seamlessly as possible. And they're called angle wings because of all the, the chippy looking angles on the, the uh, outer edges of their wings. With the wings closed, they strongly resemble the bark of a tree. And so the one on the right would show the underside, and on the left is the bright orange colors. But again, it's the mimicry looking like something that would not be a, a tasty treat that would be a, um, a defensive mechanism for them. So we'll talk about two different kinds of mimicry. One is called Mullerian, and that's named after Fritz Mueller, who was a natural history buff and uh, an early explorer in South America. And he um, observed one kind of mimicry that we'll talk about in just a moment, but where two or more different species have similar appearances as a shared protective device. So they're, they're, they're related in some way, they have a, a defensive mechanism that they both have and they look very much alike. So that's Mullerian mimicry. Batesian mimicry for Dr. Henry Walter Bates, uh, who also was an explorer in South America, uh, speaks to where a, an edible species, something that would be good to eat, um, looks very much like other species that are toxic or distasteful, and hopefully they get avoided by predators. So we may talk about Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry as the two different kinds. So let me move away just for a second. You don't see me moving away. And we'll, we'll break a little um, mantra that we've always talked about here, where the monarch and the viceroy are good Batesian mimics because until recently, it was believed that the monarch is distasteful and slightly toxic and that the viceroy was an edible species, but it looked so much like the, the uh, monarch that it was protected as well. As it turns out, I don't know if somebody ate it or if they just tested the chemicals in the, in the insect, but it turns out that the viceroy is also a distasteful and toxic butterfly. So we have now switched this from Batesian mimics to Mullerian mimics. But the, the fact is that they, they look very much alike. Predators that may have tried one, and didn't care for it. And now they leave alone anything that kind of looks like that. Back in college, I saw a little short video showing a, uh, an, a large enclosure with birds in it and nothing but butter, uh, monarch butterflies flying around. And a bird that was first introduced to that uh, enclosure flew over and grabbed a monarch in its beak and immediately spit it out because it didn't like the taste. And from then on, they could not get the monarchs to, I mean, the, uh, the birds to pay any attention to monarchs. They learned a lesson very quickly. So these are two familiar ones. And another little lesson is that in order for mimicry to work, the two different species need to be uh, living in the same general habitat as each other. So if the monarch lived in Asia and the viceroy lived in North America, predators would never learn to associate these things with each other and with that bad experience and trying to eat them. Okay, so let me do another one here. And mimicry is not always about the appearance. This is an interesting butterfly. It's a little one in the group called blues, the family Lycenidae. And these are, these are actually European species, but they've been very, very well studied. And what they have found is that the, the caterpillar gives off chemicals, which are called pheromones, that mimic the pheromones given off by a queen ant in certain species of ants. And the worker ants in the field find these larvae, believe that they are queen larvae of their own species, take them into the ant colony, and not only care for them, but they give them special treatment because they think this is a developing queen ant. So they, they are sort of parasitic on the ant colony in the sense that they're taking nutrients that something else would like to, uh, to eat. 
they are, the second thing that they do is the larva gives off clicking or little chattering sounds that uh, also mimic the queen ant. And that uh, further encourages the, the special treatment from the, the worker ants in that colony. So where caterpillars would normally be a great food for ants, turns out that these things are given special treatment and eventually go out into the, into the uh, world on their own. Another one that's sort of in the same way is this little butterfly. These are called metal marks. These happen to be in South America. And in this case, the caterpillar gives off honeydew. And honeydew is just the sugary sap that uh, they get from the, the plants that they're feeding on. You may have heard of honeydew with aphids. When they, they have a large population over the, in a tree that's over the top of your car, your car is gonna get covered with little sticky drippings as the, uh, the aphids, well, poop, I suppose, uh, into the air and it all dribbles down onto the car. In this case, it's the caterpillar larva that gives off that honeydew. And the ants discover this when they're out in the field and they love to take the honeydew. And they will actually take the larva of the caterpillar, I mean, the larva of the, the butterfly, back into the colony at night, keep it cared for, take it back out and put it on the plants uh, in, the, in the daytime so that they continue to get this food resource that they absolutely love. So another way that butterflies can fool ants into taking care of them. And that's just a phenomenon called myrmecophila. Uh, Myrmico being ants and philo meaning loving. So we'll go back to camouflage just for a moment. We have uh, many insects that have something else that might startle a predator momentarily. And very commonly it's eye spots. Eyes are extremely common on, on butterflies and moths and even beetles and other insects. So what happens if that camouflage doesn't work? So right in the middle, we see this moth. They call these I.O. moths. They're in the genus Automyris, they're silk moths. And with the wings folded and not active during the daytime, that moth is going to very, very strongly resemble a leaf. So if it just hangs there quietly all day long, it may not get noticed by the, the things that are around looking for insects to feed on. But if something does sort of take an interest and pokes at that butterfly with the wings closed, it will suddenly flip the wings open. And here are two very large eye spots. And that might fool that predator into thinking that it is uh, picked on something that it really shouldn't tackle. The eyes might be that of a large predator. It even has a little sparkle in the middle. And the family name for these moths is Saturniidae. And in this book that I showed you earlier, it mentioned something that I had never even thought of. And that is the, the family name of Saturniidae is named because many of these moths have the rings around the eye like the rings around the planet Saturn. So kind of an interesting little side note. A very common butterfly we have in California, in fact, throughout the entire country, is our very common and familiar buckeye butterfly. Yeah, bring it in a little closer. So again, eye spots. Uh, it's kind of hard to say that it resembles anything in particular, but there's just lots of eyes and that might make a predator step, step back a moment and wonder if that's a large, much larger animal than it really wants to try to eat. And of course, the, uh, the classic, you know, virtually the icon of all is this one we call the owl butterfly. And the owl butterflies are all in Central and South America. They are tropical American butterflies. They, uh, they're about 15 to 20 different kinds. And they all have this very, very same appearance. This is the top, the four top of the wings, which you don't see unless it's flying. And when they stop and rest on the trunk of a tree or they rest on the ground to feed, they fold the wings up so that only the underside shows. And therefore these very large eyes are peering back at any predator that might think there's some food there. Somebody did a, a little brief study in South America comparing the different species of owl butterflies in a region with the actual species of owls that were found there as well. And there was a, just an amazing similarity between the eyes of the butterfly and the eyes on the faces of those species of owls. It's also been suggested that rather than an owl, this might resemble a snake. Uh, when their, their wings are closed up, you don't see two eyes, you see just the one, but they have sort of a pattern of a skin of a snake. The eyes might be that of a very large snake sticking out, uh, sitting there waiting in, in uh, just sitting there waiting for something else to eat. So the owl butterfly, again, just sort of an icon for this fright coloration. 
And on that note, <clears throat> we have something else, which is just amazing. This is a sphinx moth. The, the moths themselves are actually called hummingbird moths because of the way they fly and feed. They have a very long proboscis, which is a, a hollow straw for feed, drinking the, the, uh, the, the nectar, the liquid nectar. And they tend to hover over a flower rather than land on it. So you might think it's a hummingbird sitting there feeding on the flower instead of a, a, a moth. But the larva of a couple of species can look exactly like a snake. And it's so amazing that the, the eyes almost blink. The head tends to wave back and forth as it's uh, sitting there. So if it's disturbed by something, it will inflate the head, cause it to go out to the sides and elevate off the surface so that it strongly resembles a snake, which a predator might not care to be involved with. This is a, a species that's from Central and South America, fairly widespread. Another species that does the same thing, and this is also found throughout the neotropics uh, in a very large genus of, of these moths called Zillophanes. And again, the head of the, the caterpillar can expand to look very much like that, the head of a snake with the big eye spots on it. I personally have never, never seen these myself in the field. I was, um, I, got, I don't know if it's plagiarism, but I was using the internet liberally to take some of these images off the internet. But it's just amazing to see how these things can protect themselves in the daytime. Another, again, now right now we're talking about mimicry of things that are sort of uh, in, inanimate, they're not animals. So the, the, the bark of a tree, dead leaves, and here we have a whole bunch of moths that resemble um, bird droppings. And so we can just call them poo, I suppose. But the, uh, the one on the left is one I, I found in Belize, a Central American country. And when I saw that on the sheet, I decided I really needed to get a picture of some bird poo too. So I found some on a leaf not too far away. And that's the picture on the bottom left. So if we assume that most predators that would eat moths don't also eat feces, this uh, mimicry of, of bird feces is a really great way of staying alive, as long as they're not flapping their wings. So we'll magnify it and you can see some of these other species of moths on the right and how close their similarity is, their resemblance is to feces of birds. A funny little catch here is there's a, a group of butterflies called the skippers. And the skippers in the, in the family Hesperiidae, some of the ones, some of the species are very large in the tropics. And many of these feed on bird feces. Um, it's a fight for survival in the tropics because there really isn't a lot of food available. And since even um, butterflies and moths need nitrogen and other nutrients, animal feces provides a lot of that. So the, the, the skipper butterflies, if they see bird feces on a leaf, they will go down and they will begin to feed on it. So one of the ways of attracting these butterflies is to put down fake bird poo which would be a little bit of tissue paper, uh, just get it wet, roll it up in a little ball and stick it on the leaf. And if you've got some salt water, all the better. That'll keep the butterfly there a little bit longer. It's been noticed that um, where you have army ants roaming through the, the jungle on a feeding foray, they tend to scare up a lot of insects. Birds have figured that out. So they tend to follow army ant trails. They tend to feed on the insects that come up out of there. And therefore there's a lot more bird poo on the leaves around the areas where you have army ant trails. And therefore, a lot more of these giant skippers will, will also be found in that area. So it's not just the, the adult insects that look like bird feces. Here we have a, a very common butterfly in Western North America called the, the um, anus swallowtail. The caterpillars feed on what's called, I guess properly called fennel, but as a kid, we always just called it anise plant or licorice plant. And it's a really common roadside weed. But the, the larvae have two forms of protection. One is in the early stages, the first two or three stages, which we call instars, they look like bird feces. And that's what you can see here in the, the two insects there. As they get a little older, they lose that appearance and they move more toward a camouflage. And in trying to find these things on those plants, it's very difficult because the, the patterns and the colors of that older instar larva look amazingly like the, the frilly leaves on the, the licorice plant. And another, so they have camouflage, which also protects them. 
But another protection they have is something called their osmaterium. So if they are disturbed, if you find this caterpillar, this, this kind of picture on the bottom is of the, the giant swallowtail, so a different species, but all the swallowtail butterflies have these osmaterium. If you poke it, they will suddenly shove these two very long uh, devices. And it's actually one device, but it's forked and it's very smelly. And somebody, I don't know if anybody's ever tasted it, but presumably it's not gonna taste very good either, but it's a very foul smell. And hopefully that will deter the insect. I mean, deter the predator that's trying to feed on them. So here we have the caterpillar on the bottom. Frankly, it looks like a big piece of bird poo, but the osmateria might be a secondary defense as well. And again, going off screen every now and then and not talking for a moment. We have some interesting butterflies here. These are called metal mark butterflies as well. Um, we saw a couple other species earlier. These happen to be from South America. And I, I saw quite a few of these in Ecuador and French Guiana when I was on trips there. A friend of mine said he always wondered why on earth they have all these tails until he just sort of sat and watched one for a while. And he said, when it moved, it looked like a giant uh, spider. And therefore predators may, that may have had a bad experience trying to eat a spider, because spiders can bite back, might leave these things alone simply because they resemble that spider. These are really a beautiful butterfly, as you can see on the one on the right, which is the underside, the high underside of the wings. It's got that, those rows of silvery spots, just beautiful things. It's, it's also important, I think, for us to understand that everything about every insect, in particular, every butterfly and moth, every pattern, every color, every shape is meant to uh, protect it. These, these things have evolved over many millions of years and what, what's worked for them is what sticks. So here we have a moth, the uh, interesting, the, the genus name is, I believe is Tigridia. I could be wrong, Leopardina, but the, uh, the patterns are really interesting. And you wonder looking at this dead specimen, why on earth would they look like that? And the answer is looking at a dead specimen, you really can't tell. It's gonna be more important to go look at these things alive in their habitat and watch them behave and watch what they land on. And that might be that aha moment where you go, oh, that's it. They, they, they tend to land on leaves that look like this. Maybe they've got some bacterial disease spots on them. Maybe they've got some holes from eating, something else eating them. But every pattern, every spot, every color is there for some purpose uh, because they've been living with that for a very, very long time. Here's a few more things. These uh, are some hair streak butterflies. And the ones on top, the two on the top, are absolutely astounding. And the color of the uh, underside here on the, the green one isn't perfect. It's really more of a nice emerald green, green but the, the camera's not quite picking that up. There are dozens of different species of these blue hair streaks in the tropics. And from personal experience, uh, I've found that they are very difficult to catch. They tend to fly very rapidly. They, they zip around in different directions. And a predator like a bird could spend a lot of energy trying to catch one uh, and, and uh, not, not be successful. So they might spend more energy than they would possibly get by actually eating this butterfly. So it could very well be that the bright blue on the top is meant to tell predators, I'm not worth it. Um, it's gonna be too hard to catch me. The other little interesting defense they have, and we see it on this bottom one called the, the, the I think it's called the mouse gray hair streak. And it's a really common one in the Western US. They have these fake eyes and actually fake antennae. So the actual head is up here at the top of the body, but they've got these little red eye spots and, and little hair streaks that look, make it look like they have a head at that end. And when they sit on a surface with their wings folded up, they tend to sort of wiggle those wings up and down and tend to draw attention to that, that part of their body that they can afford to lose. And as you can see on the underside, it's got those same, same eye spots. And there have been people who have studied uh, predators you know, who were exposed to these butterflies and including spiders. And they tended to go after that, that fake eye spot on the back of the wing rather than at the actual head of the butterfly. And an insect like the butterfly and moth can lose a lot of wings and still survive, but it cannot afford to lose its head. So other kinds of mimicry. 
These are amazing. And we'll actually, I'll show you some things on the bottom here first. My first trip to tropical America ever was to Costa Rica. When I started seeing these butterflies in the bottom, which are in a, a group called the, um, well, what are they called? You know, just sort of wasp mimic butterflies or moths, but they're in a family that we call Arcteids or, or uh, tiger moths. It's a very big family and it's divided into two or three different subfamilies, but they are amazing mimics of bees and wasps. So here on the top, we see a couple of large wasps. The, the big black one on the, on the left, of course, is the, the tarantula hawk, which we have around in California, but they're also found throughout tropical America. And then on the, the right is a, another smaller species, but in the same family called spider wasps. And mimicking them, and of course they can sting. So mimicking them are many of these Arcteid moths. In Belize, there are two or, different, two or three different species that we would find flying in the daytime and when you find them flying, you would swear at first that it is a wasp. So they not only look like a wasp, but they act like a wasp. And that's going to help protect them because a, a predator may not want to put a stinging wasp in its mouth. So it's, again, we just see a few species on the bottom that would look very much like large wasps that could be found in that same area. This mimicry of things that can sting is not just restricted to butterflies and, and moths. Here we have a bumblebee on the top. Obviously they can sting. And right below them are some sphinx moths. Um, these are in the genus Hemeris, and there's two or three different species in the Western United States. But when you, again, when you see them flying in the daytime, you would swear at first that it's a bumblebee. They have the same patterns of stripes of black and yellow across there. They have the clear wings and they look and act very much like a bumblebee, but in reality, they're harmless. On the right, we have some beetles. The uh, top one, I actually collected that in Wisconsin. And again, when I saw it flying along a little dirt road, I thought I was looking at bumblebees. Right below it is a longhorned wood boring beetle. It's kind of short on wings. The wings are just little stubs, but very much it resembles the, uh, the bumblebees. And at the bottom, some robber flies. And of course, robber flies can't sting but they, they can give you a little nip. They've got a pretty sharp beak and they are uh, actually very, very beneficial predators of other insects that have kind of a, a lion weight habit of, of feeding. You'll quite often find them at the uh, tip of a twig where they can look over an area and see whatever flies by. So again, mimics, all these things that are mimics, some are completely harmless. Some are maybe able to bite, but they look like something that could sting and they get protection because of that. <clears throat> Along the same theme, we have some clear wing moths on the top. The family is Cecidae, and right below them, some wasps that could be mistaken for them. Uh, years ago, I had some, some pheromone traps, and the pheromones were artificial pheromones, but they, they were chemically identical to the chemicals that are given off by the female of a Cecidae moth to attract the males. And I was putting out the pheromone in a trap over near Reno and one very large yellow jacket immediately came up and kept pestering me trying to get into the trap and I kept swatting it away until I realized it wasn't a yellow jacket it was one of these moths so the resemblance again how they fly and how they appear is amazingly similar to the things that can sting and we'll, uh, we'll stick with a couple of those but there's a whole group of flies called flower flies where the mimicry of yellow jackets and bees is, is really amazing. So we'll move on. I don't see any questions coming in yet. And hopefully people, if you have them, you can, you can type them in again using that chat button at the bottom. So we, we're going back to the milkweed butterflies just briefly. Um, the question that people ask, or I should say I ask people the question, especially when I talk to kids, and where, do, where do they get these toxic chemicals? And the answer is, Almost always in butterflies and moths, the toxic chemicals that they have in their body come from the plants that they feed on, either as a larva or as an adult butterfly. And those toxic chemicals are things such as alkaloids, and alkaloids include cyanide and nicotine and caffeine, things that cause the heart to beat faster or to malfunction. 
And they also include what they call cardiac glycosides, which is what we find in things like monarch butterflies, milkweed butterflies, and then some of these others called aristo, aristolochic acids, which we find in some butterflies here called the pipe vine swallowtail. And they feed on a, a pipe vine plant. So the, the, the chemicals come from plants. And so then the question I ask young folks is, well, why does a plant have toxic chemicals? And the answer is, so they don't get eaten by things. And it's estimated that easily 30% of the plants out there can contain these different kinds of toxic chemicals as a defensive mechanism to keep from getting eaten by caterpillars and other insects. And many of them don't have that, that chemical until they're damaged, at which point they start producing that toxin in order to ward off whatever is attacking them. So on the top, we, well, earlier we saw the monarch and the very close resemblance of that viceroy. So here we have on the top, the queen butterfly. These are found throughout the tropics and throughout Southern United States and including into Arizona. And on the bottom, we have another form of the viceroy butterfly, but it's much different in appearance from that normal bright orange one we have in the Eastern US. This has evolved to look very much like the queen, which flies where it does. So now apparently both of them have toxic chemical in them. Um, a question that hasn't been asked, but a lot of times when we get it when we have the open houses is how many different kinds of butterflies and moths are there in the world? And one estimate is that there are about 17,500 species of butterflies in the world. And about 750 of those occur in, in uh, North America. However, there's 160,000 easily species of moths. Moths are far, far more numerous than butterflies. And in particular with the little tiny moths, it's estimated by experts in those, those groups that at least 90% of the species still have not been described. They are sitting waiting for someone to identify them and give a name to them. So if anybody is interested in insects and wondering if there's still something left to do, the answer is absolutely yes. So let me show a couple of boxes side by side here. This is an amazing thing. This um, is what we call Millerian mimicry. I'm sorry, I said that. Um, Batesian mimicry, where similar things or related things have a similar defense and look very much alike. So these are heliconians. Um, let's see. I'll just very quickly take those off and put this up. This is the one heliconian we have in, uh, in California, and it's called <clears throat> the Gulf fritillary. Even though it's not a true fritillary, it kind of looks like one because it has these silvery spots on the underside of the hind wings. It's orange like the, the typical fritillaries are. But this one never used to be in California, or at least not in Northern California. It was more of a tropical butterfly. And as a kid back in the 1950s, <clears throat> and I know from the quick shot you had of me earlier, you said, can't be that old yet. Um, these things didn't occur around San Jose until one day we started seeing them. And they, the caterpillars of most of these different heliconians feed on passion vine. And my mother, for one, had a great big passion vine growing in our backyard. Um, my mother would eat just about any kind of fruit, even though the passion vine fruit tastes like perfume to me, but the butterflies were drawn to that. <clears throat> so we used to raise the uh, Gulf fritillaries from the caterpillars to the adults, raise them by the hundreds and just let them go. So, because they really, really weren't hurting anything that we've considered to be of any value. So the passion vine though, contains a lot of toxic chemicals. And throughout the tropics, we have all these different kinds of passion vine butterflies or heliconians that also feed on, on toxic passion vine and they sequester it, they use it for their own defenses. It's kind of curious that in the monarch butterflies the milkweed butterflies, the male may pass on some of those toxic chemicals to the female when they mate. And the female then stores those chemicals into the eggs and gives the eggs some level of protection once they're placed on a plant. So they call it a nuptial gift, um, something that probably is best kept with just insects. This is kind of interesting though. These are two different species. And yet you see on the left and the right, we have different forms that are identical to each other, but they're all they're different species. Even though they are different species, they have all these different color forms that are very much alike. And therefore, this color form likely flies in the same region as this color form. 
that gives the, uh, the predators the opportunity not to have to taste one of every kind before they get the idea that these things are not good to eat. A uh, common theme that you see, tend to see in the neotropics, at least the new world tropics, is that red, orange, and yellow tend to be warning colors. They're very common on insects that are toxic and distasteful, and therefore their mimics also have these red, orange, and yellow colors. Or things that don't quite mimic them, but have bright red colors, a predator might leave them alone as well because they're sort of, their brain is now wired to don't eat red things because they don't taste good. So these are just different kinds of heliconians. They uh, have a very weak flight. They're generally easy to catch, and therefore predators wouldn't have a tough time picking them off. And by having the toxin in there and a very bitter taste, it is um, a better way for them to survive. Now, let's see. Hang on while I go off and take something else. We'll show a few more examples of these different kinds of mimicry. Again, these are Batesian mimicry, related things that have a similar uh, defensive mechanism. These are little things called glassy wings or ithomeids, and they also are distasteful and slightly toxic. Their, their caterpillars feed on plants that have toxic chemicals, and there are many dozens of different species of these in the tropics. Again, a very weak flight. Yeah, they tend to fly in the darker rainforest. Quite often you will find what they call a lek, where hundreds of these things of different species are all gathered together in one area, and predators don't have to eat one of each species before they realize that there's something about them that doesn't taste good, doesn't feel good, and they leave all of these things alone that look like this. So this is three different species of, um, of but in fact, three different genus uh, levels. And if we stay with the ithomeids, the glassy wings, now we slip over to the Millerian mimicry, where here's a distasteful, toxic glassy wing on the top. So that would be the model. The one below it is a moth. So this is a moth in the tiger, tiger moth family. Here's another glassy wing, and right below it is a pierrot butterfly. The pierrot is in the same family as the whites and the yellows that we see around here, the cabbage butterfly, that alfalfa sulfur, but it just has a, a very strong mimicry and therefore protection by looking like the distasteful glass wing butterfly. Below that, we have a couple more. This is another butterfly called a metal mark. Again, a strong resemblance, similar colors, and below that, a moth a diopted moth, which is uh, close to the tiger moths, but not quite. So all of these things are going to fly in the same general area and receive some level of protection because predators have learned it's not good to eat the ones that don't taste good. Switching back over, let's see, you do Batesian mimicry. Unless I'm getting myself confused, we have a an ithomeid, so this is actually related to those glassy wing butterflies, but obviously different in appearance. It looks more like the heliconians that we showed a moment ago, and they are distasteful. And right below it is this amazing swallowtail butterfly. These things, I've, I've never seen one flying, but we have a number of them in the, in the collection, a couple of different species. But again, that strong resemblance of something that is edible to something that is distasteful and, and toxic. And by toxic, it's unlikely that a bird or a frog is going to die from eating one. But if they were gluttons and they eat a whole bunch, they might very well get quite sick. They might vomit the, uh, the food up because they just didn't care for it. Here we see a few more. If we compare these with the glassy wings. Oh, well, we have a glass wing butterfly right in the middle. So it's distasteful. A geometer moth, which we call inchworms on the top, and then another diopted moth below that that would resemble a different kind of the, the ithomeid butterfly. And moving those out, as we just continue with this little theme on Batesian mimicry, we have the model on top, a distasteful toxic glasswing butterfly, right below that an edible metal mark. Um, the metal mark butterflies we have in North America tend to be very small and sort of brown and white checkered. They're not, not particularly uh, beautiful to look at, but they're just neat little butterflies. 
In the tropics, this family called the Rhyodinidae goes crazy. There are hundreds of different species. The vast majority are in, in the Western hemisphere and many of them look completely different from each other. So the, the edible metal mark butterfly would fly with the glass wings that look very much like it and be protected to some extent. And then down at the bottom, another pierid. Again, it's in the family of whites and sulfurs, but it's gonna re resemble and be protected because it looks like the, the dis uh, distasteful butterflies that it flies near. Okay, moving along. You wondered how I was gonna find things to show here. And believe it or not, I'm starting to run out of props, which is probably just as well. We're getting closer to one o'clock. There is a very, very large group of, of swallowtail butterflies in the neotropics in this genus Parides, as you see the name on top. Typically, they're black with red and quite often metallic blue or green colors on the male on the forewing and then white spots. They, um, the one species we have in North America is called the pipe vine swallowtail. And you're probably gonna start, if you're in the Sacramento area, you're gonna start seeing those things flying around now because they, they tend to uh, come out early in the spring when there's a lot of flowers and therefore a lot of nectar available. And they feed on pipe vine, which is in the, I think it's the genus Aristolochia, but the pipe vine is laced with toxic chemicals. And so these, with the caterpillars, uh, they pick up those chemicals, they keep them in their body, they sequester, they then pass them on into the adult stage as they move through, and the adult becomes protected because of the chemicals that are um, in its body due to the caterpillars feeding. Sometimes uh, insects are, so not, I won't call it immune to the toxins in plants. Um, sometimes they just simply uh, disarm that chemical. They can, they can change the chemical structure so there's no longer toxic. Other times they, they move those toxins to someplace in their body and they sequester it and they use it for their own, own purposes. So the, the butterflies on top, the top one is the female, usually they're larger, then the bottom one is the male and they have these often green and uh, bluish spots on the, on the forewings as well. And right below that, we see a very similar again pierid butterfly in the same family as our whites and sulfurs. But because of that strong resemblance and the fact that it flies where these Parides swallowtails do, in all likelihood that, that pierid butterfly is going to have some protection. Similar to that, we have an edible nymphalid. Nymphalids include things like the buckeye and the painted lady, but the, again, that red and black theme uh, would probably be the reason that this thing survives so well. Right below that, I'm sorry, on the top is a swallowtail, toxic. In the middle is that, that nymphalum that would be tasteful. And then right below that are some tiger moths. Again, the red and black theme that helps them to be, uh, protect themselves from getting eaten by predators. And so again, things like these uh, other moths and butterflies on the bottom, this theme of red, black, and yellow is very, very commonly a red, yellow, and, and orange uh, is a very common theme when you have things that are not toxic, but they look like uh, distasteful things that are. So I think I've just about run out of props. Oh, I've, sorry, I've got one more here, which I think is also kind of fascinating. Here we have a couple more of these tiger moths. Tiger moths are in what used to be the family Arcteidae, and now they've relegated it to a subfamily level of Arcteidae. But the two tiger moths on the top strongly resemble these beetles, which they call net wing beetles or lace wing beetles. And they fly together in the same area of the rainforest. One of our scientists here said he one time caught one of the beetles. He swore, or I should say he caught one of the moths, but he swore it was a beetle until he took a much closer look at the mouth parts. And then he uh, realized that he was dealing with the wrong order of insects entirely. But the resemblance of the moth to the beetle, moth to the beetle is absolutely astounding. And the, the beetles themselves are toxic. So it would be a form then of Mullerian mimicry where they're both toxic and distasteful, <clears throat> but they have the ability to, to ward things off. And I thought I had a picture here, but I didn't and I 
should, should have done my homework a little better, but another, uh, another moth, two or three moth species in the, this family of Arcteids, these large moths right here, when they're disturbed, they can give off shaving cream. It starts oozing out of the back of their, their neck area somewhere. So it's a foam that is extremely distasteful and apparently bitter to any predator that might put that moth in its mouth when it's doing that. One of the uh, entomologists that I think he's at the California Academy of Science now said he went ahead and tasted that foam when it was coming out and he said it was very bitter and it made his mouth numb. So the, again, the predator like a bird or a frog that would try to eat one would get a very bad experience and probably would then avoid anything that has this red and black theme to it. So one more plug, if, uh, if you aren't a member of the Bohart Museum Society yet, uh, please consider joining. We have a, a quarterly newsletter that goes out and coincidentally, this, this issue highlighted these different insects that look like bird feces. Tabitha is here adjusting something. Oh, we're just adjusting the tabletop. Um, so, but the quarterly newsletter goes out to every member. And, and for students, it's only $10 a year. For most adults, it's only $25 a year, but it gives you access to a lot of really nice things. And since the uh, Bohart Museum relies almost entirely on donations and membership and endowments for its survival. Yeah, if you consider joining, that'd be great. The website, to get to it, all you have to do is type in Bohart, B-O-H-A-R-T, Bohart, and the museum's website should be the first thing to come up. So it's not quite one o'clock yet. I either talk too fast or we didn't get any questions, but um, Unless we get some questions right now, I will probably end this pretty soon and move along. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put this book up there one more time in case anybody wanted to get the name on it again. But this is fascinating. I thought I knew all there was to know about, well, I never really thought that about butterflies and moths. I started reading through this in the, the Lepidoptera area, and it was amazing what I learned. And every insect just got fascinating things about how they can survive how they mate, how they defend themselves. They're, it's an amazing group of animals. So a uh, question. Um, yeah, oh, so yes. here's Tabitha. Um, we've had a couple of comments. Uh, Greg and Davis says, hello. Um, and Charlotte says, so cool. But Charlotte also asks, what's your favorite butterfly? And Griffin wants to know that. Okay, well, first on Greg, Greg Karyophilus is one of the other lepidopterists who works with the museum. And he, he did a program earlier today, I believe, on the Gulf fritillary. Um, I'm sorry, not the Gulf fritillary, the, uh, the California dog face butterfly, which is the state designated insect and which we've kind of adopted as the, the icon for the museum. And Charlotte is, if I've got the right Charlotte, um, a, a graduate student here. And one of her fascinations is on those robber flies that we showed a little bit earlier too. And then the, the third person, I've already forgotten their name. Who was the third person, Tabitha? It was Griffin. Oh, okay. What was his question on? What's your favorite butterfly? Oh, okay. I'm sorry, my, my brain cells are moving off. It's kind of hard to pick a favorite butterfly. Um, it may very well be, I mean, as far as the thing that gets me the most excited is the big morphos, the big blue morpho butterflies that you find in tropical America. There are about 30 different species. They're almost all brilliant metallic blue on top, wingspans of four to six inches across and brown on the underside. So they're camouflaged when they're landing with those wings closed. But when you see one of those fly by you and when you're walking around in a trail in the rainforest in Central or South America, it's pretty exciting. Um, once in a while, it'll even land on your arm and sip the, the sweat because food for butterflies is, is what you get and what you find. Um, so I'd say maybe the, the morphos could be the most exciting things that you see um, in North America. I think my, some of my favorite ones are some of the most drab. And there are some butterflies called Arctics. And they're in the genus Aeneas, O-E-N-E-I-S. So they're little satyr butterflies, but most of the species are found at very high elevation throughout the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains and well up into Alaska. And I think it's because of the the habitat where they're found, which I just love to hike in, 
that they become some of my favorite butterflies as well. So it's kind of hard to hard to pick one out. You know, I'm I'm not a specialist in any group. I just tend to work the entire collection. I've been the manager of it for the last 32 years, and um, it's my my passion in life. So we have a follow up question from Charlotte, and I believe this refers to the blue morphos. Um, have you ever caught one, and then how? Because they are so fast. And the uh, another part of that is, did you wear blue? Um, I don't wear blue. I, I find it easier to track them with something else. And some of you may want to mute your computer on this one. Um, that's the reason my wife doesn't go on these trips with me. But again, food, food is scarce. And yet a lot of things that are rotting have important nutrients in them. So dead animals that have begun to rot, um, rotting fruit on the ground, and more importantly, um, urine and feces including human urine and feces. So for morpho butterflies, the, the nicest way to collect them is to get rotting bananas and just smash them on the ground. And they're very quickly drawn to those and they will just get intent on what they're feeding on. When I was in Peru, I found a little spot along next to a dirt road where somebody probably had a horse tied up and the horse did what horses and, and mules will do. And that's the likely peed on the ground because there were 15 morphos intent on feeding in a little muddy spot right there, um, about the size of a, a dinner plate. And they were so intent on feeding that I could easily pick one up with my fingers, set it back down, and it was like I'd never bothered it. It went right back to feeding. I could lay their wings over sight on the sides and they would just come right back up and keep feeding. So urine and feces are, um, important ways to attract butterflies to you. Well, well, not to you so much as to a spot where you've placed them. When they start getting attracted to you, it's not exactly a compliment when you know what they like to feed on. So after two weeks of walking around in the rainforest, it's maybe time to wash that shirt. Um, so yes, I've collected morphos. Um, when I was in Peru, it was nice because some of the very largest ones were so common that I could take one or two just as a record of that, that data point and then just appreciate the rest. So uh, I've seen them just about everywhere I've gone in the, the tropics. Once in a while, a morpho will make its way into Southern Texas or Southern Arizona, but they don't live and breed in this country. Uh, tropical Mexico is about as far North as they really live, but sometimes maybe one gets um, on a, into a, a Gulf Stream and gets carried all the way North in a wind windstorm. So Jeff, um, the Bohart Museum has nearly 8 million specimens, and you probably shared with us about 100 of those. Um, what more can you say about the collection so people can understand um, the role it plays in education and in science? Yeah, yeah, that, that'll, that'll take up a little while here because I, I have what's called diarrhea of the mouth. I used to talk and talk. Um, this is a, isn't just a bug collection here at the Bohart Museum, it is a research collection. And the, the importance of insects to the environment, the importance to humans is, you know, goes without saying, they are some of the most important animals in the world um, because of they are, they are tremendous, tremendously important as food resources for other animals. They uh, feed on plants, they, they decompose, they recycle. So insects are extremely important and therefore it's important to know what exists in any, any given area. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, <clears throat> a, a couple of people, one who's with the Bohart, have arranged trip, trips to Belize to, about half the time to collect insects. And the whole point is to catalog the species that live in Belize so that that country understands what lives there. And once you understand what's, what's there, you then start to understand what that insect's role is in that particular environment and habitat. And it may be an extremely important role. You know, if you lose that species, you might lose a species of plant or tree. So it's, it's important to know what these things are. And given that at least 90% of the insects that exist in the world still haven't been described as species, um, there's a lot of work to do. So this museum houses a, a vast collection of things uh, much of which still needs to be studied. And hopefully we'll get more people that will work on areas like beetles and flies and even the small moths. So yeah, I think that the importance of the museum is we are a, a safe place for collections to be. 
we are open and available to specialists who want to come and study those particular groups. But we also, through Tabitha, whose voice you just heard, have an amazing outreach program. It's essentially when, when times are different, we don't have a pandemic, we have an open door policy. People can just walk in the door and be shown around. And if there's a specialist working, he might show you around in the collection itself. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful collection to work with because it gives me the opportunity to help teach people about something that I absolutely love, which is bugs. And that's certainly true when Jeff is working in the collection and people come in to visit, you know, pre-COVID, um, Jeff loved, you know, talking to people and showing him parts of the collection. We do have one other question um, from Tyler John Barzi. Um, what can we do in our daily lives to protect these insects in our gardens and elsewhere around Davis? Um, I think in gardens, you know, again, I'll digress a moment here. You know, the, the monarch butterfly, the populations in the Western United States have just plummeted. They're, they're down, I don't know, 80, 90, 95% from what they were 25, 30 years ago. And the reasons, there are probably numerous reasons, but one of which is probably urbanization. The, uh, the food plant that they rely on for their caterpillars to eat is not a garden plant. They are milkweeds. They tend to be roadside weeds. And, you know, a weed, of course, is whatever you want it to be. So I think one of the things that we can do to encourage butterflies is first to, to plant food plants that they rely on, such as milkweed, and second to uh, plant things in your garden that become nectar sources for the adults as well. We, we tend to go down to the, the garden centers and <clears throat> the big box stores and buy plants that really don't belong in this country. They're, they're from the Mediterranean, they grow well, they're pretty to look at, but an awful lot of things we plant in our gardens aren't native plants. And it, it becomes important, I think, to, to start planting butterfly gardens. Um, one of the, the ladies who really helps promote this museum and other activities in, in the entomology world is uh, Kathy Garvey. And you might have seen her. She has a, a thing called Bug Squad, a website. You can get to that through the Borhut website. She uh, put our, our advertising out on Facebook. She's an amazing photographer of insects. But she also has a big butterfly garden in her yard. And she went down to, I think it was Home Depot one day, I'll, I'll plug Home Depot, and she wanted to buy some um, tropical milkweed plants. And they had it in the, in the store, and she was checking out. And as she's checking out, she said a monarch butterfly flew in, landed on the plant she was buying, and laid eggs on it. So <clears throat> we can buy things in the stores that become food plants and, and nectar sources for butterflies to draw them. So an, an awful lot of the things we have in our gardens may be pretty to look at, but insects other than pest bugs may not care. So I think that might be the important thing to help encourage populations of them. And I was talking to the director, Lynn Kimsey, earlier today and mentioned that in the latest Lepidoptera Society's newsletter, they said that over, over 200 golf courses around the country are cooperating to set aside acreage on the course to plant things like milkweeds and native flowers to attract butterflies. And they said it's working very, very well. So hopefully I didn't talk around it too badly, Tyler. Hopefully that, that answered the question to some extent. I think there's something interesting. Um, I just recently heard that because of Monarch's dire situation that in the state of California, you need a special um, scientific collection permit to handle Monarch's. Um, so I think that's sort of the first time I know a lot of teachers and people will sometimes bring mon monarch eggs or caterpillars, you know, inside to rear, to re-release. Um, but I gather this year, um, that's not allowed. So, um, in the state of California right now, capturing monarchs, even, even for good purposes, um, you really do need a special scientific permit from California, um, fish and wildlife to do that so yeah yeah i saw that kathy garvey passed that along to all of us in an email yeah. That's first, first i'd ever heard of it and they're not calling the monarch an endangered species but they're calling it a critical inhabitant of wetlands and so they're according to what she said yes it is now illegal to collect handle molest monarchs in any way in california without a, a specific scientific permit to do it 
So uh, I would like to also interject. So Greg Karyophilus' video we put out um, today for Picnic Day as well was about the Gulf fritillary, and that's an excellent oh. sort of alternative if people wanted to um, try to rear those or do life cycle lessons uh, for children. Um, also the cabbage white, you know, the humble invasive cabbage white um, is also an excellent uh, butterfly for sort of rearing and, and sort of practicing um, growing that animal. And of course you can, you know, just feed them some cabbage leaves. Um, so it kind of ties insects into our agriculture. Um, Tyler John um, Barzi did have a suggestion. He said, perhaps the UC Davis plant sale is a good place to get these native plants. And that's absolutely true. So the Arboretum All-Stars is a list of plants that um, are very um, friendly to California, drought tolerant, um, native, and sure many of them will be excellent sources for um, our insect friends. So definitely the UC Davis Arboretum plant sale is a, is a great place to go and get plants that maybe you can't find at that big box store or your, even your local you know, um, plant nursery. Um, they do have a lot of unique plants, so. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. Well, they have that every year, I believe. Several times a year. Yeah, I think, oh, okay, um, good. yeah, different seasons, different plants. The other thing is the um, Haven on campus, the um, haagen Honey Honeybee Haven, which is about a mile away from the core campus over by Bee Biology. They have a living garden full of different types of bees um, and the plants they need. So that's another place to go and visit and see what plants are sort of pollinator friendly. Um, so that's another way to sort of research what you want to plant locally in your backyard. Yeah. And uh, just to talk a little bit like what you were saying, Jeff, um, when you're planting a garden, it's sort of counterintuitive. Do you want to talk about you're not just planting for the adults to nectar, but you're planting for the caterpillars to eat, right, to munch. So do you want to talk a little bit about caterpillars eating leaves? Um, I'm trying to think of some more. We actually have another book here in the, in the um, museum for sale, and it was put together by a friend of mine named Larry Allen, and it's just called Butterflies of the Western States. And it's really a nice book. Uh, he's a photographer, he self-published it, but it, it talks about all the different common butterflies that you're going to find around the area. Oh, Tabitha's grabbed it for me. But it also talks about the food plants that their, their larvae uh, use. So a field guide to the West Coast butterflies of the United States. And it's a very, very nice book that doesn't go into huge detail, but has some nice information in it. Um, and as, you know, as far as raising things, we haven't seen a migration of the painted ladies yet, which you see on the cover here, but raising these things is simple because they feed on thistles and there's not a restriction whatsoever on gathering the caterpillars off of those and raising them. When I was a kid, <clears throat> we used to raise all, all kinds of butterflies and moths by finding the caterpillars, putting them in a cage with the proper food, raising them through to the adult stage and then letting them go. And it was uh, a an incredible experience to actually watch the transition from a caterpillar to the chrysalis or the pupa stage. And then later to watch the pupa forming the butterfly inside and then split open and have a butterfly come out of this little thing called a chrysalis. Something kids would, uh, would really benefit from being exposed to. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know all the different food plants that are available, but things like violets are for the, uh, and these wild violets for the fritillary butterflies, the lupins for many different kinds of blue butterflies. So there are quite a few things that can be planted that might draw them. And then the other, <clears throat> the other challenge is to keep people from killing them just because there's a bug on their plant. I worked with the pest control industries for four decades and taught my customers how to, my customer being the pest professionals, how to identify the bugs. And I said, one of the things that is important is to understand what you don't want to kill. And there's so many people, you know, homeowners who don't know what the bugs are, so their instinct is kill it. And so they've smashed ladybug larvae, they've smashed um, prey mantis eggs cases because they didn't know what it was. But it's important to educate people to understand that most of the bugs in their garden should be there and are beneficial to them. So planting the, the right things and leaving the certain insects alone is important. Got any more questions that are coming in? Hopefully we had a good audience. 
hopefully people got some uh, looks at things they've never seen before. Well, we did have Glenn Forrester join us and uh, oh, Greg, good. Greg also says pipe vine swallowtails are easy to raise. Yeah, yeah, you just got to find the pipe vine hanging from the oak trees. The caterpillars are black with red spots and little uh, little sort of short spines on their on their bodies and they're they're not going to harm you by picking them up but don't want to put it in your mouth. But they as long as you got access to the pipe vine to can replenish their food, they would be fairly easy to to raise. And Glenn, glad to uh, hear from you on the on the, the website too. Glenn is a friend of mine, lives in Roseville, and his uh, his son is an instructor over at the University of Nevada, Reno. Okay, we all done? Um, let me just see. I don't see anyone else. Uh, Tyler did say such an interesting talk. Thank you so much. I appreciate and... you, uh, your presence. <laughs> and I just want to remind everyone that um, the Bohart Museum of Entomology is currently closed to the public um, per, you know, UC Davis COVID guidelines, but, you know, stay tuned and hopefully, as Jeff said, you know, later this year, we'll be able to have some in-person events again. In the meantime, this talk has been recorded and will be um, posted on our website in the next few days. Oh, good. I had a neighbor ask if it would be because she wasn't able to make the live presentation. Um, oh, yes. And uh, just to clarify, Matt Forrester, um, Glenn's son, he's a professor of um, entomology up at New um, yeah. University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and he studied under Art Shapiro here for his PhD. So he works. Um, is a specialist on butterflies <laughs> and does some great work up there with some great students. So yeah. well, I was I was thrilled that two years ago, 2019, when we were still normal, uh, Davis was chosen to be the site for the International Lepidoptera Society's annual meeting. And we had it all set up and arranged for one week of meeting. It went perfectly. And a lot of the, the most important specialists of Lepidoptera in the country had the opportunity probably for the first time to see this this lepidopter collection because this one sort of fell off the radar uh, for quite a while but it's a very very important collection with with tremendous number of, of insects in it and jeff that is largely because of all your dedication and effort all of these years well, um, i was gonna, I was gonna say that but i wanted to be <laughs> humble so <laughs> So really, um, the Bohart is an amazing collection. It's probably one of the seventh largest in North America, like I said, with nearly 8 million specimens. And um, we are very friendly here and, and open to having people come in and ask questions and explore. But I don't see any more questions right now. So I'll just say thank you, Jeff, for taking your time today to talk with everyone oh, um, okay. about, about moth. And Can't wait to get back. Wait to get back to face to face. That'll be so much more fun. I know. So again, when we are open, please come and join us. Look on our website for information. And um, Jeff will be here waiting to say hello to you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good picnic day. Thank you. Bye bye.